Hi, welcome to today's webinar on vehicle and equipment dangers. My name is Mike Shaw. I'm a senior loss prevention representative with the TML Risk Pool. With me today is Brandon Honey, who's a loss prevention representative with the pool. Topics today in our webinar will include striking overhead objects, striking underground objects, use of equipment for unintended purposes, and altering equipment, equipment fires, vehicle entry and exit, and lack of training. We wanted to spend some time today discussing some of the things that, that employees are exposed to day in and day out, but may not necessarily be a very frequent type of incident that occurs. Many times whenever these types of incidents occur, uh, they can be very severe. In other words, very high dollar. And what we want to try to do is to educate our viewers today about what those hazards are and how they can set themselves up to try to prevent occurrences from happening. Exactly. So let's talk about striking overhead objects. Uh, this comes in uh, any number of forms, including overhead power lines, poles, things like that. Typically lines, though, uh, that we talk about from utility or uh, electric lines even. A good example of this is um, I'm aware of a claim that happened with one of our members uh, probably about 10 years ago had a solid waste driver that was making a right turn onto a very narrow intersection. There was a vehicle uh, in that intersection that he had to clear. Well, consequently, while he was trying to clear that vehicle, he clipped a light pole that was on the corner of the intersection. Uh, so training, being aware of surroundings, being aware of clearances, that's the kind of thing that can prevent that sort of incident Another from Another example that we've experienced with this, uh, with a, a ladder truck in the fire department where it, it, they've extended it into the power lines overhead, you know, either out in front. We've had one that occurred at a station even like that when they were doing their inspection. Um, when they just, somebody just wasn't, wasn't watching or wasn't aware that it was even there. Exactly. And, and many times, uh, if you have crews that are out working, spotters are a good way uh, to, to, a good tool to use to try to prevent that sort of thing from occurring. Some of the hazards that are out there include above ground and overhead objects, uh, utility communication poles and lines, utility communication boxes and pedestals, mailboxes, other vehicles that are in the road being either parked or moving, uh, structures such as awnings. There's a very famous video floating around on the internet where a, a, a gentleman was pulling a, a fifth wheel camper and pulled underneath a bank awning and basically pulled the whole awning down over the drive through Same thing happens at gas stations, uh, anywhere else at Public Works Yard. Yes. Uh, we've had a, we've had we, we've had claims from uh, we had a sp particular claim where uh, they had a new piece of equipment and and it was taller than their old piece of equipment. They get it on the trailer, start mm -hmm. taking it out to the job site, and caught a bridge over I-35 and. Yes. Uh, bad deal for everybody in that case. So let's talk about some of the prevention measures uh, that can be taken. Training, training, training. If you're getting a new piece of equipment in, you need to spend time understanding that piece of equipment. Get in the operator's manual. Make sure that you understand what the hazards are, what the dangers are of working with that. Then you need to make sure that your folks that are going to be out there operating those pieces of equipment in those vehicles understand how to use it. Uh, many times as our folks are out there running their routes, doing their work, in operations, they may notice very low hanging lines or obstructions uh, that people should be made aware of. Document those. Document where they are. Spend some time during roll call or shift change or whatever in educating people where those types of obstructions are so that people can avoid those if at all possible. Another thing that people don't consider but is actually very effective, you can actually build relationships with the local utility companies. And by the electric code, the National Electric Code, utility lines, communications lines, anything above ground have to be, uh, have a certain clearance over the ground. If those communications lines, uh, electrical lines, utility lines are too low, you can document, you can uh, contact those utility companies, let them know where those low hanging lines are. They don't want their equipment torn down right. and, and uh, causing an inconvenience for their customer. We certainly don't want uh, our members to tear anything down because that's going to stop your operations. And in return, if it has some sort of um, uh, money exchange, if, if we have to pay out for a claim, that's going to affect your contribution in the future. We don't want that to happen. Uh, another thing that can, you can do is locate and mark above ground and overhead objects. 
uh, prior to work commencing, uh, we've all driven in driving down the road and you see the sign that says overhead power lines. You know, that's a good example of that. Also, you may be able to work with uh, your local code enforcement to make sure that the streets have proper clearances. Make sure the vehicles are parked on the sides of the streets that they're supposed to be parked on. They're not too far out in the streets. Uh, we did have a recent incident uh, that Mike and I were visiting with a member about, and it was a fire department. And they were returning to the station after a fire call, and they were having to travel through a residential area. Well, whenever they made a right turn, it was uh, a T intersection. It was a T intersection, and whenever they made a right turn, the tail swing came out and clipped a vehicle. Not a lot of damage, but the problem is the close clearances. The, the people were parking too close into the street. On both sides of the street and at the end of the T. So That's they were exactly having right. multiple yeah. cars. To it was to virtually impossible for that vehicle to get through there, which begs the question, if the fire truck can't get through there in a non-emergency uh, operation, how are they going to be able to get in there with an emergency? Good discussion to have with the people who can make those decisions. Striking underground objects. This is probably even more common uh, in, in what we see from a claim standpoint, whether it's uh, uh, striking your own uh, objects or uh, striking a utility or something like that. We see lots of uh, fiber optic, cable TV, things like that, that we want our gas lines uh, that we certainly uh, don't want to don't want to be into. Well, we're all very aware of, of the state. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it a mandate, but there are fines that get uh, handed down by the state uh, whenever gas lines are hit. We want our members to be aware of those things. Uh, things to consider, uh, communications lines, utility lines. Uh, communications lines can be fiber optic, phone, cable, anything along uh, that sort of uh, uh, line. The, the problem with fiber optic, and the reason that those are so expensive, is you cannot splice a fiber optic line. Uh, whenever those get torn up, you've got to replace the entire section. And that's why those are so expensive. Uh, phone lines, cable lines, many times the, the utility companies will have a contractor come out and dig those lines, lay those lines, and, and cover them up. Well, if nobody goes out and inspects that subcontractor, what happens many times is they have a, a, a mandate to bury it so many inches beneath the surface. That doesn't always happen. That doesn't always happen. We've had many claims where people are just simply out mowing and actually hit a phone line or a cable line that's supposed to be uh, a couple of feet. 18 to 28, 18 to 24, 24 inches, inches, and it winds up being you know, six inches underneath yes. the concrete. Yeah, I've mean, seen that a lot. As the ground wears away through erosion and, and, and water runoff and all of that, that eventually exposes those lines. So that's literally how we've had lawnmowers hit those lines. So utility lines, uh, water, gas, sewer, uh, most of our members are very well aware of those hazards. Though. We hope. We hope. Because it does happen when you wind up striking your own line where it, it moved from where it was originally placed. Yes. Yeah. So what are the prevention measures? Obviously the first and foremost thing that our members can do is make sure that they do line locates. Call 811, call dig test, make sure that they come out and do the locates maintain that documentation cannot stress that enough if a line gets hit you need to have that documentation because that's going to help our our claims department be able to process that, that claim appropriately also train your folks you don't want to just start going in there and, and ripping out ground with a backhoe or a ditch witch you want to make sure that you do hand probing uh, hand shoveling if you have to if you know that you're close to a line uh, one of the tools that we have available to our members is what's called the Excavation Documentation Guide. Uh, this is a step-by-step -step guide of how to document an, a, a dig site. And what you want to do is to take pictures before and after every single dig. You want to take the pictures around the entire dig site, documenting where those locate marks are. If a line gets hit during the digging process, the excavation process, what you're going to do is take a, a third set of pictures that document how far, how far down the, the line was and how far off it was from the locate. And what that does, again, is it provides us documentation so that we can process any future claims appropriately. Right. Because those line locates are accurate most of the time, but there are occasions when they're not exactly where where they were supposed to be. We've had lots of members tell us that a lot of these people that go out and do the locates, they just put marks everywhere. 
and you have no idea where to dig because you know they're trying to cover their behind right so that if they don't get in trouble uh, so they just put lines everywhere and it makes it very difficult for our members to be able to do the work that they need to do right next discussion on using equipment for unintended purposes and obviously this picture is uh, something that uh, we all kind of joke about but it's something that we honestly see more often than you'd think uh, it, it's whether it's making a repair like this or hanging Christmas lights or hanging signs on in the square or on the light poles or whatever uh, this is something that we see quite regularly honestly. if you look if you look at this picture you know you, you have to ask yourself what is this guy exposing himself to? right uh, obviously a severe injury even potentially a fatality but that's just how it affects him. How does it affect his family? You know, do they not have a provider anymore? Do they not have a husband, a father? Uh, how does it affect the co-workers? The job doesn't go away just because one employee is not there. It actually compounds the problem of being able to get the same amount of work done with fewer people. So you want to be wise. Make sure that you use equipment appropriately and uh, don't get somebody hurt uh, in that process. So what are the hazards associated with that? Working beyond the scope of the manufacturer's design. If you get outside of what the manufacturer designed, you're exposing your employees to injury, you're exposing the equipment to damage. A good example, we had a member that had a jet rotter machine, and, and for anybody that's not familiar with that, what it is is a machine that, that pressurizes a, a, a hose line and you stick it down into a sewer system, sprays high pressure water to be able to clear any blockages that may be in that sewer line to prevent backups into uh, homes or residences or, or businesses or whatever. Well, you can run the pressure up that has a pump on the back side and you run the pressure up to get as much pressure into that nozzle as possible to be able to clear that line. Well, the hose on this particular jet rotter was, or the nozzle, excuse me, was about 12 inches long. And it had an orifice at the end that was probably about, oh, maybe half an inch. Well, what they had done is they had modified that. They took, took a hammer and beat down the nozzle opening. So instead of a, a, a circle, a hole, now they had an oval, it was very flat. And that was increasing the pressure even beyond what the manufacturer recommended. So whenever they got to the site, they tried to jet rod the, the uh, blockage. They ran the pressure up to what the manufacturer recommended, but because they had crimped that nozzle down, it drastically increased the pressure and the hose actually shot back up out of the hose and or out of the hole and smacked the employee right in the face. He was very severely injured as a result of that. No amount of eye protection, face protection, hard hats, any of that is going to protect an employee from a very hard, high pressure line coming back and hitting him in the face. Right. And we see lots of injuries like that with homemade equipment or uh, things like that where they're trying to modify a, a tool or a piece of equipment to fit a certain need because they don't have something that will get that job done. Yes. And, and employees, if, if you are aware of that kind of uh, situation where you have a need and you're not able to get your job done and you're basically having to modify a piece of equipment, make sure that your supervisor is aware of that. Don't take it upon yourself to go in there and make modifications on your own. Let your supervisor know and run it up the chain. You do not want to go beyond what the manufacturer recommend in, recommends because what you have done is modified that piece of equipment and you are going to be solely responsible for any results of any incident. Right. There's no ability to transfer any of that risk to the manufacturer or anybody else now because you've now modified it beyond exactly. what it was designed to do. So how do we prevent that? Obviously we've, we've discussed a lot of this already. Employee training, Policies and procedures. You want to make sure that you have good policies and procedures for how to operate equipment. Uh, I use the fire department as a good example. Whenever they have a new fire truck come in, they spend time training their operators, their driver operators, on how to use that piece of equipment so that it doesn't get torn up. The last thing that they want is to be on a fire scene, have an inexperienced operator uh, damage the equipment, trying to get water out, and then you've got firefighters uh, exposed to hazards on the fire scene and you've got a property that's probably going to go up in flames. So that's just one example of how not having good policies, procedures, not doing the training can affect operations. Yeah, you know, and, and even more on the getting, getting training from the manufacturer or the supplier, even if it's a rental of a piece of equipment, most rental companies will provide some training, even basic, 
on just the, the, the how-tos, especially if it's a piece that you're only going to use for a, for a short period of time for a you know, smaller project or something like that where you're only going to use it for a day or two. Make sure that you're, you still know how to operate it and, and that the, the, the supplier or, or the, yeah. the, the rental company gives you specific instruction on how to operate that piece. Don't of be afraid to ask. They don't want their equipment torn up. Uh, manufacturers don't want a bad name for their equipment. So right. they're usually very willing to give that training for you. Equipment fires. <laughs> this is a, a, a big one for us. Obviously, this is not necessarily a, uh, uh, an, an injury standpoint, but lo losing a piece of equipment uh, is something that we have to deal with quite a bit. And uh, unfortunately, we've, we've, we've had multiple claims dealing with losing pieces of equipment to fire from various purposes. And it's not that these types of claims are very frequent, but whenever they do happen, they're generally very severe. You know, right. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands right. of dollars for one piece of equipment. Uh, so the, some of the hazards, electrical issues, make sure that uh, your batteries are, are hooked up correctly. Uh, they're, they're clean. They, they don't have a lot of corrosion on them. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using correct maintenance. I've, I've, we've seen um, issues where we had uh, a uh, equipment uh, maintainer come in and use the wrong filter on a compactor and what was happening is the fluid was leaking out onto the hot engine and it actually caught fire and burned up a, a compactor in a landfill. Those things are very expensive. Another good example of a, a landfill operation, uh, cleaning. Take a, a bulldozer. A lot of landfills use bulldozers to tamp down and compact that, uh, that, that debris and that trash. Well, they have cowlings that are underneath. And inside those cowlings, a lot of debris and trash will collect inside there. We have seen fires uh, occur in those types of pieces of equipment. Tub grinders are another, uh, whether it's in a, at a landfill or, or within a parks department or whatever you're, if you're using for cleanup, lots of buildup uh, of s sort of sawdust as it's grinding mm -hmm. um, and get, get stuff down in there. And, and as that grinder's doing its thing, it, it heats up and, and just combusts and Yeah, those fine it particles, it doesn't take much to get them going. Right. And it's something you may not see until it's too late uh, exactly. because it's trapped inside. So how do we prevent these things? Uh, one of the things that, that, that is very beneficial, especially whenever you're looking at backhoes, trackos, bulldozers, compactors, these big pieces of equipment, drag lines, uh, you want to have an installed fire extinguishing system inside there. Spec that out whenever you're specking equipment. Make sure that you get that in there. Uh, fire extinguishers on normal vehicles, be it a patrol vehicle, even a fire apparatus. Uh, normal pickup truck, normal car, put a fire extinguisher in there. Uh, if those fires do occur in, in normal vehicles as well. Uh, also, equipment inspection and maintenance. If you're not maintaining your equipment, if you're not looking at it periodically, you're going to increase the likelihood of, of something like that occurring. And again, you have to take, th there are certain pieces of equipment that you need to do more than just kick the tires and walk around and look at it. Some things require you to you know, take a panel off, get inside, look to see that there's not debris buildup or there's something not inside that could cause. We've seen uh, fires where, uh, you know, even something, you know, during the off season, you know, in a, in a parks department where you've got a mower, where you've got a, a mouse that decides during the winter to go build a nest up against a muffler. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, that straw or, or the, the grass or whatever that they're using to build a nest from, even a bird, uh, build that nest inside there. The first time you go to crank it up for the year, that muffler starts to get hot. Um, next thing you know, your your fuel tank underneath the muffler is you know melting, and yeah. now you've got a, a a real incident. So, vehicle entry and exit. Obviously, this is something that's uh, more along the sides of employee safety, but it's something that we do see quite often from a from a claim standpoint of people getting on and off of uh, out of a vehicle or getting on and off a piece of equipment. And a lot of people may be saying, you know, really, this, this is a problem. Actually, it is. There are far more people that get hurt getting on and off of a piece of equipment and in and out of a normal vehicle 
than what one may realize. Uh, there are actually quite a few of these incidents. And it doesn't earth. have to be even a, a larger piece of equipment. We're not necessarily talking a, no. a dump truck or, or, a, or a backhoe or anything like that. Yeah, just a normal pickup or a, a patrol car. In fact, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking specifically about what those hazards are and how to prevent it. Uh, the heights of equipment, what are the hazards? The heights of the equipment is a hazard. Uh, obviously, the higher the equipment, the more hazard the employee is exposed to. Uh, unfamiliarity with different, different pieces of equipment. If you have a new employee come in and work on a brand new piece of equipment, they're probably not going to know what all the hazards, the catch points and the turn points and the handrails and all of the things they could actually snag an employee on their way up or on their way down. Uh, inadequate maintenance. We had an employee that was injured one time that was uh, getting into a dump truck. And what had happened was the uh, railing, the, the step where the employee was to step that was connected to the fuel tank had not been maintained. The employee was very well aware that that railing or that step was giving way, he still put his weight on it. And as he was about halfway up past the point of no return of getting up or going down, the railing gave way, busted his kneecap, fell down and injured his back. Uh, that's a pretty severe incident just because of a lack of maintenance. The employees, again, were aware of that problem. The supervisor was most likely aware of that problem, but they had not done anything about it. Uh, various parts of equipment can actually catch on your clothes, uh, catch on your person, and prevent you from being able to get on and off freely. Uh, generally, what happens is it's whenever people are getting out of a vehicle or off of a piece of equipment. It's not really whenever you're getting in or on that and equipment. And some of this may not be necessarily uh, specific to the equipment that, that's causing the problem. It may be the attire, the, if you've got a vest on that's too big, uh, or, or anything else that, that could catch if you know any kind of loose article of clothing. And a great example, and, and we're going to spend some time on that in just a minute, patrol officers uh, that, that get hung up in their seat belts. Uh, another problem that could uh, contribute uh, to these kinds of incidents, wet mist, dew, mud, uh, you need to make sure that you have good shoes or boots with a defined heel. Uh, that will be very helpful. You want to jump, you do not want to jump off, you want to make sure that you climb off. And I'm going to tell a story on myself, I'm going to tell myself a little bit here. Uh, before I did the job that, that we are doing now, uh, I was a firefighter and one day we were washing a, a brush truck in the high bay and there was water all over the floor and I knew it before I ever even did it that I was about to have a wreck. And I decided to jump off face first off of the back of the truck and sure enough I went down busted my head on the back of the truck and uh, just kind of laid on the concrete while everybody else around me laughed. So I learned a good lesson. I wasn't severely hurt but yeah it, it, it happens to the best of us. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time specifically talking about larger apparatus and then we're going to also talk about police patrol units. Uh, with larger equipment the old rule of thumb three points of contact Two feet in one hand, or two hands and one, or two feet, or two hands and one foot. Thank right. you. Yeah. Thanks, Mike, for the help there. <laughs> Always face the vehicle. Don't do like I did. You want to go face off. You want to make sure that you're facing the vehicle. And, and that's as you're getting on. And that off. may be a new concept to some people about because it, be. it gets one of those things as you you know like a backhoe as you you want to step out, facing, you know, out of the cab, yes. but you actually need to turn around and use the yes. handholds that are on there. It's so simple to just open a door, grab a handhold and step off face first. Well, it's just like coming down off of a ladder face first. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're facing the equipment, facing the apparatus as you're coming down or getting on. Uh, also, uh, normal vehicles and pickup trucks or actually any piece of equipment, look where you're stepping. We've had a lot of injuries, especially at nighttime where people step out and they step into a pothole and roll an ankle. Uh, just be aware of your surroundings. Storm sewer in, we've Storm had sewer lots in. of that. Exactly. Uh, ensure that the seat belt does not obstruct your exit. And uh, if that seat belt gets hung up on you as you're trying to get out, uh, you can actually uh, get hurt uh, as that happens. Patrol vehicles. This is a little bit unique for police officers. Uh, we've seen some uh, injuries where whenever a police officer is out on patrol, they're simply driving around looking uh, for things to occur for them to have to react to. Whenever they have to stop suddenly after quite a bit of time of patrolling and have to jump out, they have to do that quickly. And whenever they have to do that quickly, it causes a lot of problems. 
Uh, one of the problems is as they push off, and turn, as they push off with their right foot in the floor pan and turn their body to the left, uh, it tends to put a lot of pressure on the right knee. And we have seen some injuries that occur to police officers on the right knee. Also, look at the depth of the floor plan. Floor pan. Uh, whenever the Crown Vicks were used, the floor pan was about this deep. Whenever a lot of the uh, police departments went to the chargers, the floor pan was about three or four inches deeper. Significantly deeper. Significantly deeper. And what was happening is they were tripping with their left foot as they were trying to turn and they were falling face first. Uh, another big problem is how the steering wheel can be different in different types of patrol vehicles. Some steering wheels, like the GM products, I'll uh, have a simple lever and the steering wheel just tilts up. You need some clearance in how you get out of that vehicle. You don't want your leg uh, jamming up underneath the steering wheel as you're having to get out. You can cause some problems there. You don't want to be banged up before you actually get to the bad guy. Uh, with different vehicles, whenever you release the steering lock, what happens is it'll bring the steering wheel up, but it'll also telescope in and out. And if you put a lot of hand pressure on that steering wheel to help brace yourself, get out of that vehicle, that steering wheel can move on you and cause your body to jar. So be aware of how the, the, that particular vehicle is configured as far as the floor pan and also how the steering mechanism works. The best thing to do is to configure your vehicle so that you can easily drive and easily get out whenever it's time to react. Without having to make Without too many having to changes. make a bunch of adjustments. Also, police officers, be aware of your seat belt and how it can get hung up in your duty belt. Uh, whenever you instantly have to jump into action, releasing that seat belt suddenly can actually hang up, say, in your taser on your, uh, your, your left side. And as you're getting in, out of the vehicle, you actually get pulled backwards. Make sure you practice, as silly as this sounds, practice getting out of your vehicle and understanding how to keep yourself safe because you don't want to get hurt getting out of the vehicle and then have to uh, respond to somebody that's going to be fighting you. And I think a good adjustment for that sometimes is just maybe adjusting where you keep equipment on your belt. It may be a little different from what you're used to, but if it's something as you change vehicles and you get something new where the seat belt's in a different alignment from what it used to be in, a, in, a, in an old vehicle, you may have to make some adjustments to how where you keep things on your belt to make sure that if it's a little lower or a little higher, it's not catching on something as you come out. Exactly. Couple of, uh, a few couple other tips personal habits, stretching exercises. If you're going to be like a patrol officer, again, for example, stop every once in a while, keep your body warm, stretch a little bit. Uh, again, use boots with defined heels, and it, you could even go so far as the employer is developing a footwear policy and, and how to get on and off of vehicles, in and out of vehicles. As you've heard, uh, many of the topics that we've hit so far, uh, training has been in every single one of these so far. And it's uh, to the point that we want to be sure that we, we, we touch on it again because it's such, a, it's such a big issue to be sure that people are trained properly for not only the equipment that they're using, but the tasks that they're doing with that piece of equipment. Yep. Employees need to be set up for success. If, if, you're, if you have a lack of training in your organization, you're actually, uh, to put it bluntly, you're setting your employees up to fail. Uh, you need to be spending time with your employees, educating them how to use the equipment that they're going to be using. Uh, and you want to set them up how to use it properly according to the manufacturer's recommendations. You also want to teach them about the hazards that they're going to be exposed to. Uh, if you're going to be uh, have a public works employee that's going to be out excavating uh, sewer lines, uh, you need to talk about trench safety. You need to talk about equipment safety. You need to talk about person protective equipment. Uh, there are lots and lots of areas that they have exposure to injury and uh, damages. And you've got to make sure you spend some time with them. Uh, inexperience due to lack of training exposes others to the hazard. If you have an inexperienced employee out there operating a backhoe, well, what does that expose the others that are actually working out there right. on the ground to? So you want to spend some time making sure that they are a good operator, a uh, good working employee so that they don't get somebody else hurt due to their inexperience. Well, and two, an, another example that we've had recently is where we had an employee injured where the employees who, the other employees that were on that crew recognized that this person was standing in the wrong spot but didn't react to yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, one of the big things that we hear over and over again whenever we go out and visit with members 
is they train employees because that's how they've always been trained. You know, they train them to that standard. Well, who says that that standard that, that they've always been trained to is the right standard? Right. So maybe you need to spend a little bit of time reevaluating what it is that you teach your employees. And a good place to start doing that is with a new employee orientation. If you are not doing new employee orientation at the, at the uh, basically the overall level and at the department level, uh, you're really missing out on a great opportunity to set employees up for success. Uh, we recently did a webinar on new employee orientation. I would encourage you to go to the webinar library, download that, review it. That particular webinar is for employers, the, the, the administrators, to give them some ideas of how to set up a new employee orientation. I would encourage you to use our resources. We have many, many resources. We have videos, the online learning center. We have these webinars that we do once a month. Uh, those are all included with your membership. You're highly encouraged to use those. Uh, you can actually take existing courses in the online learning center and add information, your specific information, to that course. You can develop your own course. Not only, you're not just limited to what is there uh, and, and freely downloadable. So what are some of the prevention measures? A job safety analysis is an outstanding tool uh, to be able to use to try to ascertain what employees are exposed to and develop procedures for doing a job safely without getting somebody hurt. Uh, it's a little bit more involved than what we can go to during this webinar. It is a downloadable uh, Excel attachment on our webpage from the publications page. If you have questions about a job safety analysis, please contact your loss prevention representative. We'll be happy to visit with you about that. Learn from your mistakes. Many vehicles, uh, solid waste vehicles, uh, public transit vehicles, uh, police officers, they have video cameras right. that are available on those pieces of equipment. It, hey, if somebody messes up, it's, it's okay. Let's learn from that. Let's, let's watch that video, figure out what went wrong, set people up for success. Don't repeat the same mistakes. Right. Uh, supervisor observations. As your supervisors get out there and they observe their employees working, uh, it's a good idea to make sure that they're using uh, the, the operational techniques that they've been trained to use. Uh, if they're veering off of that, then you might need to kind of redirect them just a little bit. Accident investigations, kind of along the same lines of, of teaching from your mistakes. Uh, figure out what went wrong, what can we do to prevent it from happening again, let's make sure that we put action plans in place to prevent that. And, and that's the whole point of doing an investigation. It's not necessarily to figure out who did something wrong yeah. or, or, or if this thing was preventable or not. The, the idea is to make sure that it doesn't happen again, that we, we can assess and evaluate the, the individual incident and then figure out what controls we need to put in place, whether it's physical or whatever else, to be sure that that doesn't happen again. That's probably the biggest mistake that I see members make is they, they, they put together a safety committee and they're just doing what they've seen in the past well, we've, we've moved beyond that in, in the safety and risk management world. We don't want to find fault. We're not trying to find uh, what the employee did wrong. Uh, we want to try to find the facts. So the whole preventable, non-preventable thing, fault, no fault, needs to go out the window. You really need to look at the facts. What happened? How do we keep it from happening again? Is really what you're trying to determine with an investigation. Uh, trend analysis. We can provide loss runs to you. Uh, you can look at your own losses. Try to figure out where you're having trends. Do you have a lot of back injuries? And if you do have a lot of back injuries, are those caused from lifting? Are they caused from getting on and off of vehicles? Uh, are they caused from sweeping? You know, what activity, the action uh, that the employee was doing whenever the incident occurs is what you're looking for. And one of the things with the trend analysis is not just to look at the trends, but make sure that you respond to yes. what those trends are. If you keeps so-and-so got hurt again, this, this, the, the same incident keeps happening, we keep having the same kind of injury. Don't let that continue yeah. like that. Make sure you, you respond and react to that and, and again, make some kind of change. Yeah, put those action plans in place. Uh, we have an accident prevention plan template that is available to our members and our loss prevention reps are available and willing to visit with you about that at any time. Uh, it develops a basic framework 
of a working safety program, highly encourage our members to utilize that resource. You don't have to use all of it. You can use portions that work for you or you can actually implement the full program. We have lots and lots of resources that are available to you. Really encourage you to get with your loss prevention representative, discuss what's available. Also go to our website, tmlirp.org, and go to the loss prevention page. Look at what's available to you. That's included with your contribution. You don't have to pay anything extra for any of our services or resources. Those are your services, your resources that we offer. If anyone has any questions, again, like Brandon said, please feel free to contact us. Our number's there, 1-800-537-6655. Uh, you can send a general email to lostprevention at tml.org, or if you have your, your rep's information, you know, feel free to contact them directly. Uh, if you have any questions about this topic or anything else that we may have uh, from a resource or, or a service standpoint, please feel free to contact us. And we thank you for being with us today. Thank you.